Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word about the sovereignty of God this morning, but until we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Reach out to friends, family members, everyone you know. Let's get as many people watching our online service on a weekly basis. All right, take care, and I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. Good morning, LMCC family. I'm so glad you could join us this morning for our online service. I encourage you, if you got your Bibles, to turn to Romans 9, uh, verses 17 to 23, is what we'll talk about today. But this is a fascinating section of Scripture. In fact, <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, Romans 9, 10, and 11, there's just some very, very uh, uh, deep theological principles that Paul is drawing out to make his case for the fact that God has not forgotten about the Jewish people. And he's, you know, as, as a master theologian, as a master, uh, you know, pastor, he's developing this in a long argument, which is typical of Paul. Um, and, and this morning we're going to talk about the idea that, that God is sovereign. And, and that's something that can be a challenge for us, particularly those that have uh, more of an Arminian background in our theology. And uh, even if you don't know what Arminian of, it, Arminian of this, it's hard to say. <laughs> I'm going to start over. Austin, I'm scratching the first part because I messed up, okay? So make sure you cut it out. Well, good morning, LMCC family. I encourage you, if you got your Bibles, turn to Romans, the ninth chapter, and verses uh, 17 through 23. We're going to talk about how big is your God this morning. And in particular, this section of Scripture focuses on God's sovereignty, which is a subject that many Christians really, really wrestle with, particularly the examples that Paul uses here in talking about how God can freely choose some individuals and seemingly reject other individuals. And it's important for us to maintain um, this tension between God's sovereignty and human free will. And, and that tension uh, remains all throughout chapter 9 in particular, but again, it rolls over into chapter 10 and chapter 11. And, and it, it reminds me of a movie I saw years ago, maybe you've seen it too, the original Willy Wonka, not the remake. The original was the best, uh, with Gene Wilder as Willy Wonka, but th there's a scene where Augustus Gloop, uh, again, the kind of the chunky kid, uh, approaches the Chocolate River, and he's fascinated by it, and he starts drinking from it, and, he's, and, and of course, Willy Wonka's telling him, don't, stop, wait, come back, but he ignores him, and he ends up falling into the river. And so as he falls into the river, he gets sucked under. And of course, his mom is, what is wrong with Augustus? Where can I, I cannot find him. And, and Willy Wonka says, oh, you're not going to find him. The, the suction has got him. And it's, it's actually tremendous. And so you can see Augustus Gloop moving underneath the water. And, and as this is going on, Willy Wonka, in a kind of a casual manner, pulls out a stick of gum, takes a stick of gum, starts chewing it. And, and, and as he does this, we see that Augustus Goop gets stuck into the tube. And so there's all this pressure building behind him as he's stuck in the tube. And, and Willy Wonka makes the classic statement, the suspense is terrible. I hope it'll last. And, and that is kind of, <laughs> tongue in cheek, cheek, of course, in Willy Wonka, but that is kind of what happens here in Romans 9 this tension remains between the fact that God is sovereign and yet human will and how we how we wrestle with or bring to a conclusion either of these because both of these remain in the section of scripture and Paul doesn't necessarily resolve it and so for us <laughs> like Augustus Gloop the suspense is terrible I hope it'll last so let's take a look at the scripture here in Romans 9 17 through 23 Paul says this, he says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you 
and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then, why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Let's pray. Father, I pray as I go over this section of scripture, which uh, for many people is a bit of a challenge, God. I pray, God, give me clarity. Father God, let me speak clearly in such a way, Father God, that, Lord, you will speak to your people and challenge all of us to make you Lord of every aspect of our lives. Because after all, God, you are sovereign. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So there's some pesky questions and issues in this section of Scripture that many Christians deal with. One of which is, is God unjust? He's favoring some groups of people. He's disfavoring other groups of people. Hey, God, what gives? A second issue here is this idea of how can God hold us responsible when he's the one that determines what happens? And that, that's a tough one here in this section of Scripture. So let's talk about it here. And again, there's three questions I want to bring forth as we're developing the concept of God's sovereignty. And the first is simply this. How just is your God? And again, it says in Romans 9, 17 and 18, uh, you know, about Pharaoh, that God raised him up for this very purpose, that he might display his power in Pharaoh, and that his name, God's name, might be proclaimed in all the earth. And, and, and again, here's the tough part. It says God will extend mercy to those uh, that he wants to extend mercy to, but then he will also harden those that he wants to harden. And again, this is one of the most controversial claims in the Bible. And again, it, it begs the question, what is just? And, and, and what is our measuring stick? Because if you say something is just or something is unjust, or hey, that's fair, or that's not fair, it is assuming some sort of standard of measurement here. And see, what Paul is drawing upon, uh, and again, there's allusions here in this section of Scripture, is two Old Testament Scriptures when he talks about, I'll have mercy on whom I'm going to have mercy, and I will harden those to whom I will harden. And the first is, in the extension of mercy, God connects uh, his standard of justice with his character, okay? So, so when he says, I'll have mercy on whom I want to have mercy, he's referring to Exodus 33, 19. It's the incidence of the golden calf, right? Is, is that the, the children of Israel, as Moses is on you know, Mount Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments, receiving direct instructions from God, we find out that the Israelites, meanwhile, are down at the bottom of the mountain, you know, engaged in all kinds of pagan revelry and idolatrous worship of the golden calf. And, and, and so it says this, okay, as, as, God, as, as Moses is wrestling with God, God, what's going on here? What are you going to do? This is what the Lord says. I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord. Okay, that's very significant. When he says, I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, God is directly connecting uh, what he's going to do with his character. His name, who he is, is justice. Who God is, is goodness. Who God is, is love. Our standards of justice and love and goodness are contingent. Contingent on what? Contingent on who God is. And that's what he's directing Moses to. And so he's saying, listen, I'm going to extend mercy to those whom I'm going to extend mercy. Again, remember, the context of this is what kind of judgment is coming on the, the Israelites because of their idolatrous worship of the calf, right? But then Paul also, in this section of Scripture here, in Romans 9, 17 through 18, refers to another Old Testament Scripture, and that is Exodus 9, 16. Okay, so, so again, it says in Romans 9, 17 and, and 18, 
concerning Pharaoh, I'll ra I've raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you. If you look at Exodus 9.16, um, it says, But I have raised you up for this purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And so we know of what God does with Pharaoh is he hardens his heart. Okay, Pharaoh had already hardened his heart. Pharaoh had already set in his mind that he was going to resist Moses' call. Hey, hey, Pharaoh, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go. And we see this over and over in Exodus where there's miracles, where there's displays of God's power and wonders going on. And over and over again, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart to the extent that God finally said, okay, fine. That's the way you're going. I'm going to give you the consequences of your choice. I'm going to harden your heart, or I'm going to calcify your heart even farther here. Okay, so, so what's going on here? God extending mercy to some people. God hardening the hearts of others. Okay, Really at issue here is not so much justice, what is just, but that God is sovereign over everything. And so when justice is extended, when mercy is extended, when hardening of a heart is extended by God, it, it, it's God's sovereignty. There's nothing we can say or do about it. And that's hard for us <laughs> as humans because we think, hey, we can control everything, right? We're, we're modern people. We've got science. We've got technology. We can just science up and remedy this situation instantly. That's kind of how we think. And yet we're coming face to face with God and his sovereignty. Or say, stated in another way, God is sovereign and I'm not. God is sovereign and you aren't. And we've got to come to terms with that. In fact, God is so sovereign that he's even sovereign over evil as well. Look what it says in Psalm 76, verse 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. So even in evil, again, as I'm recording this, uh, there was a major school shooting yesterday in Texas. Uh, as of this recording, I think 19 people are dead. A tragic evil wickedness being displayed once again. But the Bible says that God is even sovereign over that and that God can use that for his purposes. Okay, now I want to be quick to add as an aside, some of you listening might be saying, well, where is God in that? That was horrible. That was a school shooting. But we've got to realize that, hey, we live in a fallen world of man's own choosing. The fundamental problem with humanity is not gun control. The fundamental problem with humanity is not greater security at schools. The fundamental problem with humanity is we are rebels. We are rebels toward a living God. We are rebels toward God and his ways and his rule. And because of that, we reap consequences in this life. Now, God is a good God. In fact, God is so concerned about the evil in the world and the wickedness in the world and the injustice in the world that he sent his very son from heaven to this earth to die on a horrible, brutal cross, taking on himself all of the injustice and evil that has ever befallen humanity and, and ever will, and he obliterated it on the cross, right? In other words, God cares about every situation, and God is sovereign over every situation, and God is moving behind the scenes to cause all things to work together for the good of those that love him to those that are called according to his purpose. And that, my friends, is the backstory of Romans 9. Again, he's wrestling with this idea, why are Gentiles getting saved and Jews, you know, by the boatload are rejecting God? Why does it seem like injustice continues? And he's trying to explain this. And the first point he's talking about here, again, about God extending mercy and, and hardening others, right, is this idea of the fact that God is sovereign. Okay, second of all, another question we've got to wrestle with in this passage of Scripture, and I've got to ask myself, and so do you, is how biblical is your God? I mean, how biblical is the God that we view in Scripture and the God we understand and know and love. Look at Romans 9, 19 to 20, verse 8. Again, this is the pushback. This is the pushback of somebody looking at God hardening Pharaoh's heart and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, God, you hardened his heart, and yet you call him to be accountable for that hardening. 
God, that's not fair, right? And look what it says. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? In other words, if God has already set it up that some people are going to be hardened, how can we be culpable? How can we be responsible in that instance? God, that's not fair. And yet, look what Paul says. Who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Okay, I'll be candid. When I read these scriptures, okay, and I read about the fact that God hardens some people, and he extends mercy to other people. Esau, God hated, but Jacob, God loved. There's a part of me that rises up and goes, God, that's not fair, but I've got to be careful, and you've got to be careful that we don't extend humanly or culturally devised standards of right and wrong and good and evil from our cultural background or our personal opinions or our feelings. Because Paul is developing something in scripture that many Christians, including myself, often forget. He is Lord. <laughs> he rules. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And a lot of times in our intimacy with the Lord and in our communion with the Lord and in our fellowship with the Lord and in our grand times of worship with the Lord, we often forget the fact that He is the Lord. He rules over everything and everyone. Okay, And so, again, this is the biblical conception of God that Paul is developing here. Okay, And again, we see this in Scripture, is, is that God is portrayed as the one who plants and uproots nations. Go just take a look at, at um, um, Daniel, the first and second chapter. Very clear that God establishes leaders, God removes leaders. God raises certain people up, God removes certain people. God raises up nations, God destroys nations. He is Lord, okay? You know, God chose the children of Israel to exterminate the Canaanites, right? Seems pretty brutal. But we also know from, from Genesis chapter 15 that God said very clearly, listen, I'm going to give this land to you, Abraham. God's promising Abraham. However, however, the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. So God was extending mercy to the Amorites, right? As he was trying to reach them and get them in a right relationship with God. But sooner or later, God's patience wore out. And again, fast forward to the end of the northern kingdom. What happened? The, the people of God resisted God. The people of God rebelled against God. So God sent a wicked kingdom, the Assyrians, to take them out. Same thing happened to the southern kingdom in 586 B.C. God sends the Babylonians to wipe them out, right? In other words, God using evil for his purposes. How about the crucifixion of Jesus, right? At the hands of sinners, okay? Betrayed by Judas, handed over to the brutal Romans, sinners, right? God used something evil and wicked and turned it around for our salvation, right? And so what Paul is trying to develop here is how much do you trust God? How biblical is your God? Is your God sovereign or can you make him do whatever you want him to do? Can, is, is he the subject of your whims? Or are you, are you a creature? And is he the creator? Which one is it? Because a lot of us, particularly as individualistic Americans, particularly as Christians, many of whom have been informed by the Word of Faith moment, movement, that is very much an autonomous, hey, I can claim this, I can pray this, I can declare this, and God will do this. But we read this section of scripture, and it's pretty clear, we're not Lord, we're not autonomous. We can't make God do anything. He is Lord, He is King, He is Sovereign, we are not. That's biblical, that's Bible here. In fact, <laughs> in fact, if we really wanted to shoot straight, in fact I will, okay? What Paul is developing in Romans 9, 19 and 20 is this idea that, hey, listen, when we say, listen, God, that's not fair. Basically, that manifests a rebellious spirit. That manifests an idea or an understanding that, listen, God is subject to me, I'm not subject to him. And Paul is trying to obliterate that as he's trying to develop what who God is and his mercy. So again, as we conclude here, let's look at Romans 9, 
20 to 23, okay? Because as, as he's developing these hard concepts, now hear me, I want to be clear, these are hard concepts. These are hard things to, to, to wrestle with. But Paul is developing God's sovereignty so that it can show ultimately what God wants to do is show mercy to the unbelieving, in this case, the unbelieving Jews, all right? But this is fast forward to any unbelieving people group today, in particular, how about our people group? How about the Western world? How about the secularized, you know, modernistic world where we get our truth from science and our meaning from the market? And it's very easy even for Christians to become practical atheists and think we don't need God because after all we can make breakfast cereal without God we can split atoms without God we can develop vaccines with God why would we need God and Paul's trying to develop this concept listen listen if it weren't for God's grace if it weren't for his mercy all of us all of us are destined for a devil's hell but what God has done in Christ has extended mercy to people however We've got to understand that sometimes there are not breakthroughs because God is working behind the scenes to bring about his ultimate purpose. So again, let's take a look, look at the scripture in Romans 9.20 where he says, listen, shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right out of the same lump of clay to make some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use, right? What is he saying? He's saying God predestines general outcomes, right? Either wrath or glory. But the saved or the destroyed determine their own fate. Let me say that again because I think that's worth repeating because I think that'll help us understand this section of Scripture. God predestines the general outcome, either wrath or glory. But the saved or the destroyed determine their own fate. And see, when Paul's talking about the potter and the clay, and the fact that the clay doesn't look at the potter and say, listen, why are you doing this? I think I've got it figured out better. The backstory of that is Jeremiah 18, verses 5 through 10. And this is where he uses this potter analogy. But what we need to understand is the context of the potter analogy in Jeremiah is, listen, God extends grace to people that repent, but God judges people that don't repent. So we see a combination of God's sovereignty, but also human free will and human choice. Let's read this here, okay? This might help you understand this a little bit better. I know it did me. Jeremiah 18, 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of a potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed. And if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended for it. And so what is he saying here? He's referring to the potter and the clay here in Romans 9, uh, 19 through 20 to 23. But what he's trying to get at is this idea that God is sovereign. We dare not tell him what to do. And yet, by using that analogy, he's referring to a section of Scripture that tells us, listen, if someone repents, God is gracious and merciful to forgive them and to, to forgo the wrath that was going to be extended to them. However, if people persist in their disobedience and continue in wickedness and continue in rebellion, then guess what? <laughs> They're going to get what's coming to them. And see, what he gets at here, especially at the back end in verse 23, is that he's trying to make the riches of his glory known to the object of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory, right? Is that what he's trying to get at and the punchline of this section of scripture is that God is so sovereign, he actually uses idolaters to advance the gospel. He's actually using, again, think of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was an idolater. Pharaoh was a wicked man and yet what did God do through him? Through his obstinance, through the hardening of his heart and God hardening his heart, God displayed his miracles, which were a sign to the Jews to believe in God, but they were also a sign to the wicked Egyptians that this Jehovah is the 
true God. God using someone's wickedness, God's using someone's idolatry to further his glory, to, to, to demonstrate to the nations that he is the one true living God. So as I close this morning, let's realize that God is working. God is working through this Biden presidency with all of its failures and flukes and foolishness. God is working through the invasion of Ukraine by the Russians. We may not see everything, but God is working. And even in difficult situations, like as I record this, this terrible shooting in Texas, God is working. God is sovereign over all of those areas. Either we trust God or we don't. Again, like the song Waymaker, even though I don't see that you're working, I'm still believing that you're working, right? I don't see it. I don't understand it. But God is never, God has never stopped working. And if nothing else, this section of scripture should challenge all of us. I know it's challenging me. Do you trust God? Do you believe he's sovereign? Do you believe that God is just? Do you believe, is your understanding of God biblical? Do you understand that God is saving and God is gracious and that in the midst of all circumstances in our lives, there is a redemptive purpose? God's heart is to save the lost. The very fact that the Antichrist hasn't shown up yet, the very fact that the end of the world has not come yet, is a testament not to the fact that God is off sleeping somewhere or God is aloof, but that God is merciful giving every person space to repent. So you know what this should do to me? You know what this should do for you? This should motivate us to share the gospel. This should motivate us to reach out to people because God wants people to know him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. And Father God, I pray as we talked about the sovereignty of God, my heart's desire is that every single one of us would have a more biblical understanding of who God is, and what God is doing, a, a more biblical understanding of the fact that God is just, and a more biblical understanding that God is saving and God is gracious, that he does not desire anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to know him. And Father God, let use us as vessels, Father God, of outreach, of vessels of the gospel of God's saving love to everyone in whom we come in contact. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Church, it was great to be with you today. Until next week, take care, and I call you blessed.